the sharing the past couple of weeks has been powerful, wouldn't you say? Uh, Anne Marie and then Barb, they've thrown down the gauntlet against the rest of us, haven't they? They've, they've dropped the mic in modern parlance and said, all right, your turn. And, you know, if we keep this up, there's going to be some healing taking place. I'll tell you what, this is how you do it, is this vulnerable sharing that we're getting right now. If, if, if we keep this up, the Holy Spirit just might show up, everybody. I'll tell you what, this is exciting. There's healing going on, right, David? There's healing happening. That's our, that's our theme. That's the theme God gave us, and that's something we need to pray for. And to bring in healing is to, to cleanse, to bring in light. And so that's what's happening. It's really exciting. So pray for healing and volunteer to share. It's, it's your turn. We didn't get anybody this Sunday, so we need people to share. All right. Well, we'll get you in here some point, David. You got to book it earlier than Sunday morning. We're in, we're in David's life story. <laughs> and last week we had, that's what we're doing this summer. We're walking through King David's life story. And last week we had the epic David and Goliath. And it was time to fight the Goliath, the Goliaths in our life, in our mind, that we battle. It was, it was time to go to war. It was time to face Goliath and come at him in the name of hosts and put him in his place. It was time to fight. This week, since there's a time for everything, this week is time not to fight. Last week was time to fight. This week is time not to fight. And who we're looking at, who the subject is, in the three chapters of Samuel that we looked at, uh, Jonathan is always the subject. So Jonathan's the subject today. Jonathan was Saul's eldest son, and therefore, King Saul, therefore he was heir to the throne of Israel. He was the heir. He was the prince of Israel. And David was a clear threat to usurp Jonathan, a clear threat. And so what most people would say, many would, we, we might think that it's time for Jonathan to fight. It's time to f have Jonathan fight for his job. He was going to lose his job to David. It was looking very, very more and more clear that David was going to take his job. So wouldn't he need to fight for his job? That's his money. That's his power, his status, his fame. He might need to fight for his life because if you read the rest of Kings and Chronicles and if you know anything about the, the old monarchies, if someone usurps the throne, their first piece of business is to what? Kill everybody who has a biological claim to the throne. That's what you do. You get rid of them. So in, in logic and history, we would tell Jonathan that he needs to fight. This is a fight for his life. He needs to take out David because David's going to take him out. And what did Jonathan do? Yes, he did not, Jonathan did not fight. Jonathan's the picture of Jesus today. He sacrificed himself for God's will. He self-sacrificially said, God, whatever you want, I see that this is your will. Therefore, what I, what I want in defending my job, my money, my inheritance, I will allow you to have that because I see this is your will. He didn't consider David his enemy. He considered David his brother, treated him as such, did give him his armor, which was a way of saying, now my authority belongs to you, David. And then he loved him. He did what Jesus tells us to do. Love another as yourself. In our subject of healing, we can focus on ourselves quite a bit, and that's okay. You're supposed to apply the oxygen mask to yourself before you help the other people, see? So that 
it does make sense that in, in addressing healing, we need, to, we need to look at ourselves. But sometimes we also have to be careful about not, being, not it being all about us. Because the healing process, first of all, we've realized that we're never done healing. So if we wait till we're done healing, then we'll never ever help anybody else, will we? In the, in the 12 step, part of the 12 step process is to carry the message to others. Because part of our healing is to help healing in others. So it's always part of it. So Jonathan brings us to that understanding that it's not just all about ourselves. Part of our healing is helping other people heal. We must help others as part of our journey. And so we're called to be Jonathans. Can you think of a Jonathan in your life? Have you ever had a Jonathan in your life? Can you think of that? Someone that God brought to you? Someone that loved you? Even someone that it was seemed a bit odd and a surprise that, uh, that they would. Maybe a little out of place. That was Chad. Chad sang a song in honor of one of his Jonathans. And he was telling me about this guy who, who was a young life guy for his whole life and, and never grew up and just stayed, <laughs> stayed in young life. And um, so you think, this, here's this guy. It's kind of odd that he's this older guy, yet he's acting like a kid and he's my friend. Well, he's a Jonathan. He was a Jonathan to many people, I am sure. Do you know what the name Jonathan means? Nathan, Nathan is gift. And John is Jehovah, Yahweh, gift from God. Jonathan is a gift from God. We're called to be Jonathans. And Psalm 20 is going to show us how to be Jonathans. You're not waving at me. You're waving at the baby, aren't you? See, the baby is always the star. I'm like, she's waving at me. No, she's waving at the baby down. We're going to learn to be Jonathans, aren't we, Nikolai? Psalm 20 is going to teach us. Psalm 20 starts with seven blessings. This is what Jonathan would pray for David. He would pray for blessings. This is what a Jonathan does. The Jonathans pray for us. And so there's seven blessings to start. And the number seven means completion. It means fulfillment. So this is a complete blessing that we start with in Psalm 20. In the very first one, this is 1A, is may the Lord answer you when you are in distress. And so the prayer begins in asking the Lord to help the person that we're helping, we're praying for, asking them to be there in trouble, asking God to help them when they're in trouble. And so the first thing in being a good Jonathan is to be there when they are in trouble to pray for them when they're in trouble, to be there for them. This is your opportunity. If you're looking to be a Jonathan, your opportunity comes when someone you know, when someone God has put in your life is in distress, is in trouble. That's your opportunity right there to be a Jonathan. And when difficulty comes, what most people do is they they kind of distance themselves, and it's out of fear. I think in the back of my, our mind, we think trouble, difficulty is contagious. And so we don't, when someone's having trouble, we just kind of automatically distance ourselves from them. We're, we're fearful that it's contagious. It's not a, maybe a conscious thought because it doesn't make any sense, but it's what we do. And then we also, out of fear that we maybe don't know the right thing to do or to say. We don't know what to say. If you don't know what to say, don't say anything. It's, a, it's actually perfectly the, the right, it's the exact right thought. Don't say anything. Yeah. You don't have to say, there's not, nothing you can say that's going to fix, you know, the, what's going to help is that you're there, you're praying for them, and they can tell if you're being authentic. So don't, don't have these irrational fears. Jonathan, despite the, the sticky financial, or, uh, financial and family ties 
of him and David. It didn't make any sense. And Saul's saying, come on, Jonathan, help me kill this guy. He had, Jonathan had lots to fear, but he didn't. He put all that aside, and he came to David's aid when he needed it. We need to be sensitive to people now. We need to be careful in, in um, being someone's Jonathan. We can't just declare ourselves their gift. I'm your Jonathan, your gift of God. Here I am. You know, we need to... We need to give, you know, people, especially when they're going through difficulty, we need to give them their space. That's where we need to listen very carefully to the leading of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will show us and will give us those opportunities. And, and it, won't be, it won't be this huge burden. It will be, it'll be joyful. It'll be, and it will be the right time, which is so important. So we need to listen to the Holy Spirit and fear not. We don't need to listen to the voice of fear. We need to listen to the voice of truth in being there for people when they're going through difficulty. This is 1B through 3. These are more blessings. We read the first one. These are more. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings, Selah. There's a movement in these first blessings, and it's a movement in where the blessings are coming from. They start with from Yahweh, it says, and Yahweh is the God of Israel. He's the creator God. He's the big God, the God of all life that gave life. And so that's the first. Then the God of Jacob and that gets a little more personal, the God of the tribes of Israel. Then from the sacred place, the blessing comes, and that's the temple or the tent, the tent tabernacle before the temple was built. Then Zion, and that's God's city on the earth. And then all the way down to the altar itself, where God delights, remembers, keeps in mind, and delights in your sacrifices. So then all the way down to the altar. And so what we see is a God that seems far away, the creator God, the big God, that created everything, is now actually come down and is very personal and is right there and actually knows your sacrifices to him and delights in that time. And sacrifice also means worship. Coming down to your very worship for him, your prayers, your time with him, your time in community worship. And so a very far away God comes close. And so that brings me to number two on being a good Jonathan, and that's encourage a closer walk with God. Our goal in helping someone through a difficult time is, is not just that they be healed or that this be fixed, or resolved. Sometimes that's what we tend to focus on. How can I resolve this issue for them? That's not really our goal. That's not really a Jonathan's goal. What we do, what we want, our goal, is that they would learn to rely on God through this process. Because difficulty often does that, doesn't it? It often takes difficulty for us to learn faith in God, for us to grow in our faith. C.S. Lewis says, pain is God's microphone. So instead of focusing on how we can resolve this as quick as possible and get them back to, to you know, certainly there's some practical things we can do. We want to do what we can to help in a practical way for sure. But that's not necessarily our goal. Our goal is to help them have a closer walk with God, to learn to have more faith, to rely on Jesus. We're not even, if, if, if we put ourselves in the situation where we've become the, the fix-it person for them, that's incorrect as well because Jesus is their Savior. We're not always going to be there. As Jonathan wasn't always there for David. He was David's Jonathan for a season. And it was God's will 
and he followed the Holy Spirit in loving David for that time in that season. And he helped David get even closer to the Lord. Salvation, healing, victory, reconciliation with God, those things come from Jesus. So encourage a closer walk with God. Then there's more blessings here. This is four through five. May he give you the desires of your heart and make, your, make all your plans succeed. May we shout for victory, shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. And these blessings seem to say that may God give you everything you want. Answer your prayers exactly how you've asked them. And anything that you want, you're going to get from God. Now, is that a good thing? <laughs> have, we, have you, in, in looking back over your life story, in looking at your diary, at your prayer journal, do you see that God answers our prayers exactly the way at that time we wanted them to be answered? Is that the way it works? <laughs> is the, it, you know, would that even be, have been a good thing? We, we, look, we look and we realize that, no, that's not actually the way. I'm really glad it worked out the way that it did, that God answered that prayer in his way, according to his will, his time. And we realize that truth. When, when we walk with the Lord, we find out that he knows our hearts better than we do. And so his will is actually more fulfilling, is a more fulfilling life than our fantasies of what we think would make us happy. It's one of those, there's these wonderful secret paradoxes in life with Christ. I just, just for example, I thought of a few of them. When you enter into service, into the service of Jesus Christ as your king, when you become his slave, when you enter into his service, he is your king and he is your master, you find that you are the most free that you've ever felt. A secret paradox of life in Christ. When you conform yourself to him, when you try to be like Jesus as much as you can and you conform and you allow him to transform your mind by the Holy Spirit and you try to be as much like Christ as you possibly can, you find that you've found your unique identity. Another paradox. In fact, all of us, the more we all conform to Christ, the more unique each one of us becomes. Wonderful secret paradox. And then if we seek only God's will, we find ourselves the most fulfilled. And so these are, the, these are the things that we should teach. Share the secret joys of life in Christ. That's to be a good Jonathan. Let me just tell you what's happened for me. Let me tell you my experience. Not you need to do this. But let me tell you, let me tell you a, a crazy thing that God has done for me. Let me, this paradox that I've found to be true in my life. Here's a, Here's a good one. This is a good verse, Psalm 37.4. There's a, a word in here that uh, is only used here in this psalm. It's only used twice in the Bible by David. And um, it's here in this psalm, and then it's in this verse, in Psalm 37.4, which brought it to my attention. But it's a perfect explanation, perfect um, verse for this point. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, verse 6, now this I know, now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. This is the heart of the psalm right here. This is a verse in the Old Testament that Jesus shines, that Jesus is clear in. You see this, you see Jesus here. 
This line, the Lord gives victory to his anointed in Hebrew, the Hebrew roots are, it's just three words, Yahweh, Yeshua, Messiah. Yahweh, Yeshua, Messiah. Yahweh, God. Yeshua, Jesus, which means God saves. Messiah, his anointed one. God saves his anointed one. That's Jesus. And in context, it's actually used victory here because this prayer, and this is, this is a prayer for a king that's going out into battle. So salvation is victory in that context. So it's used as victory here, which makes sense. The verse speaks to Jesus' resurrection. God saved his anointed one. God saved his Messiah. He resurrected him by the power of his right hand, which is the Holy Spirit. So here we see the gospel in the Old Testament. The heart of this psalm is the gospel. Yahweh, Yeshua, Messiah. And because he has saved Yeshua, he has saved us. So the fourth thing is tell the power of the gospel. Anytime the gospel is spoken, and I've heard it spoken, and I've heard it spoken very poorly, <laughs> but... <laughs> And, and I've spoken it very poorly myself, thank you very much. But any time the gospel is spoken, it has power. The gospel, the gospel changed the history of the world. If, there, if, if, if you know anything about history, you know that the gospel changed everything. It still has that power. The gospel has the power to change people's lives. Sp speak the power of the gospel. This is seven and eight. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. You shouldn't trust in horses. It takes 37 years before a triple crown winner can win. You, if you're trusting in horses, that's not very good odds. And any, any horse named Pharaoh, you're not going to bet on anyway, would you? I mean, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall but we rise up and stand firm. And so the fifth thing is to teach trust. It's the key component going forward because whoever we're helping, they're bound to have more difficulties. I, I, it's, it's such a strange thing when we, we have a friend or we're trying to help someone who's in trouble. Our, I, I don't know about you, but my primary motivation is to rescue them out of that little piece of trouble right then and then set them back and say, what a good job. I, I put together the plan for this person and just fixed, fixed it all for them. That's, I don't know why we have that desire. That's the way we, we, we want to help people. And, you know, we're not going to always be there for them. And they're going to have more trouble. In fact, most of the time I find that they have a whole nother line of issues right after the one I've just resolved. <laughs> I haven't even scratched the surface. It's, you know, I've, I've t peeled one layer off the onion, and I think I've resolved their issues for them. No, God's going to have to do that. They're going to have to trust in the Lord. Uh, it's, it's a truth that we see in our, in our life story. It's a truth that we see in David's life story. Because, you know, right, right after the Saul issue went away, because Saul and sweet Jonathan were, were killed in battle, by the Philistines, that David was running from Saul, so he wasn't able to fight. He even wanted to go in the battle with the Philistines. He just wanted to be, be part of it. And, and so Saul and Jonathan were killed, and so the Saul issue was over then. And then the rest of David's life was a summer breeze, wasn't it? I mean, he had no, there was just, everything was cool after, you know, they, okay, we'll take care of that Saul problem for you, David. We'll take care of that, and then you'll have no other problems in your life. You know, the, we, we're, we need to trust in the Lord. We need Jonathans. We need to be Jonathans. We need to live in a world that's full of Jonathans. Jonathan was a gift to David, a most unlikely gift, but he loved David, and he prayed for him. And he would pray this prayer. This is verse 9. O Lord, save the king. Answer us when we call. Thank God for your Jonathans. 
Thank your Jonathans if you get the opportunity. And then thank God for your Jonathans. And then keep, keep on the lookout for your opportunity to be a Jonathan. And so since we don't have any sharing, I guess it's my turn then, right? Um, so I, I, have a, I have a funny story to tell about a Jonathan. Um, I've been, I go to the salt room, which is right around the corner, and, and um, for my allergies, and, and it's a very healing place. Um, you just breathe in salt. And um, I, I'm medication-free. I changed my diet, and, and I go to the salt room, and, I've, and I no longer have asthma or allergies or get sinus infections, all that stuff. God has healed me through this process and continues to heal me. It's a continual thing. Um, and so it's, and, and you get to know the people who you're um, breathing salt in with. You're in these rooms, and usually it's kind of quiet, meditative, and um, I go in there regular, so I kind of know who the regular people are, and there was this older uh, Asian woman that would sit in there, a very kind of meditative person, and so I would always not necessarily say anything, but one day she saw that I was reading the Bible, and she got real excited and told me that she's a charismatic Christian. And um, then she told me that her, her gift in her training is dream interpretation. And um, so she has been interpreting my dreams, and Anne Marie's too, <laughs> a couple of Anne Marie's too, and and even the the employees there, which they all know I'm crazy uh, by now. Uh, they're like you. And her name's Tamaki. This lady, you know, she's like in her 60s. This crazy Japanese lady, and we're sitting in there having church, and they're like, "Oh, you're going to go into church with Tamaki?" They're they're wanting to charge us rent. I said, "No, that's your tithe." We're, you can't charge us rent to have church in here. And, and what's happened is we've even started, um, the, the employees have dreams, and Tamaki starts talking to them about their dreams, or their boyfriend breaks up with them. And we've been praying and ministering, me and Tamaki, to, to the employees in the salt room and everything. And so, um, but it's been very healing in, in looking at these dreams. I told her my reoccurring dream is that I'm at the beach, and there's some good waves, and I can't find a surfboard. That's my reoccurring nightmare of, you know, and of course, <laughs> I can't, where my, and I'm marching up and down the beach, and I can't find a surfboard, you know, and so if that's about surfing, of course. No, no, Tamaki is a very good dream interpreter. It's always, it's always spiritual for her, it's, and it's always metaphoric. You don't take it literally, and so she said, she she interpreted that. She said, you desire to ride the Spirit, and you can't find the means. So pray for the means to ride the Spirit when you have that dream. Boom. And so I've been, and, I've, and all of a sudden I'm remembering all these dreams from, from my youth and growing up, and she's, she's interpreting for them, and it always has a spiritual, very positive uh, message. I had, I had this dream where I was in Africa, I've never been to Africa, and I was driving, driving a Jeep on, on this grassy Sahara. There was these beautiful mountains in the background. It was night, and it was full of stars. And all these African kids were running with me, and I was driving. I thought I was maybe going to run them over, but they were all laughing, and we were having fun. And, and then next thing you know, there was a cave in the mountain, and looked into the cave, and I'm claustrophobic. When, the, when we went to Guatemala and, and the kids went in a cave, I was like, I'm not going in no cave. There's no, you're not getting me. It was full of bat poop anyway, so I was laughing at them as they all came out. I'm like, nice, nice cave experience you guys have had. So anyway, I look into this cave, and it was the, it was the same sky, but it was diamonds in the dark cave walls. It was the exact same as the sky. And she said, that's God's calling you into this intimate relationship with him when you see his beauty displayed just like the glory of the sky. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is the healing that I'm receiving. So I told her this week as I've been looking, I said, you're my Jonathan. You're, you're God's gift to me right now to, to share your gift with me. So that's my uh, sharing. And now Tom's going to lead us to the table.